All right. Get your Bibles out, if you would, please, and go to near the beginning of the Bible, Numbers chapter 13. If you are um, uh, following along with our reading plan, you'll probably notice that we've been spending a lot of time in the beginning of the Old Testament reading a couple chapters a day in the book of Numbers. is not the most exciting Bible study you can have. Uh, I chatted with Cindy the other day, and she agreed with me, <laughs> you know. And I don't know about you guys, but I get to like, especially you get to like the real confusing part in Leviticus where you can tell that Moses did not index any of the information God gave him. He just kind of wrote it all down. Like, oh, I'm going to put this over here and put this over here. This information really belongs like 10 chapters earlier, but I'm going to put it down here because, well, I've already written there and I don't have Microsoft Word, so I'm going to have to write it on this tablet. Ha <laughs> ha, get it? Yeah, oh, I'm really tired. Anyway, um, and, you know, it all seems out of order, it's confusing, but if you stick with it, you run across some really good gems, and that's what we're going to talk about today. In fact, I have preached on Numbers chapter 13 before, it was in 2008, and yes, I do go back to check and see if I've ever preached on a text before, because I hate repeating myself, but uh, we're going to do a little bit of repetition today, but a lot of you weren't here back then anyway, so it doesn't make a difference, but uh, we're going to look at this from a different perspective. Numbers chapter 13... And I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this. Maybe you haven't, but I just experienced something new this morning, and God told me what it was. I was sitting in my chair, and we're worshiping, we're singing, and we're praying and meditating, and I was excited and exhausted simultaneously. Has everyone been like that before? Where you just, you just, your brain is shut off, and all you want to do is go lay down, or maybe, I don't know, watch some TV or eat a burger or something like that. All you could think about is just just relaxing, and that's what your body wants to do. But inside, there's this odd excitement of like, oh, yeah, let's go. And then the two like have this conversation inside, and they argue with each other. That may be me being really tired, that part. Uh, maybe you guys are. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, and on my seat, and I'm praying. I was like, God, I want to just worship you with my whole being. And he reminded me, Micah, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And my flesh is weak this morning, but my spirit was really excited. And he said, that's okay. Your spirit's all that counts anyway. So I was really excited. I was like, yeah, all right. I can worship God even if my body just wants a burger and a nap. So anyway. All right, Numbers chapter 13. We're going to read through sections of this and then talk about it as, as we go, so keep your fingers there. But I want to ask before we get started what versions people have. Who has the NIV? Raise your hand if you got the NIV. And if you have multiples, you can raise your hand for whichever. A couple of you. How many? Anybody amplified? Any amplified people in here? People with back pain and shoulder problems from carrying around that Bible? <laughs> uh, King James? Or New King James either? A couple of you aren't raising your hands. <laughs> what, what else you got? I know, Bill, you've got NAS, or not NAS, you've got, you have the NAS New American? You've got the NIV. Who has the um, New Living? The Action Bible. Yeah, it doesn't read word for word like the rest of them do. Um, you got what? New Living. Anybody else have New Living? You got New, okay. Oh, you got the, the New English? Okay, all right. That's a good version. I don't ever use it because I'm busy using other ones, but I like that version. Um, all right, well, what am I going to use? I'll use the Amplified. <laughs> no, no, let me go to the NIV. Uh, more of you had that than anything else. All right. Numbers chapter 13. Let's start in verse 1. We're going to do some skipping around. Number 1. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites from each of the ancestral tribes, send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites, and these are their names, and we're not going to read their names because I can't pronounce half of them, and it wouldn't make any difference if I did. So go down to verse 16. These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Uh, then it says that uh, Hoshea would change his name to Joshua. Verse 17, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, now let's stop there for a second. What did God tell Moses to do? Send some men to explore. Send them to explore the land. Now, then Moses takes this command, goes to the people, or goes to the leaders, and says, verse 17, go up through the Negev and into the hill country, see what the land is like. Now, that should, there should be a period right there. See what the land is like, because that's what God told us to do. But look what he adds to it. And whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. 
What difference does that make? Why did Moses tell these spies to check out the people? God didn't say anything about the people. He said, go explore the land. Moses isn't sending explorers. He's sending evaluators. Go evaluate this land. Let's keep reading here. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? Well, that's a stupid question. It's a land flowing with milk and honey according to God's word. So why would you need to double check what God had to say? Let's keep going. And what kind of, uh, or what kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? Well, Moses, what difference does that make? You're going to knock down one of the biggest walls in the ancient world with some trumpets. Okay, he doesn't know that, of course, but uh, go down to verse 20. How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. So God tells Moses, send some people to explore the land. Moses sent some people to evaluate the land, its people, its cities. What? Is it peaking real bad? Uh, turn me down just a little bit then. Uh, just turn the masters down. Okay. I'm going to have, apparently, I knew I was going to get excited this morning. I should have warned her. <laughs> so God tells Moses, explore the land, and then Moses adds to God's word and sends people to evaluate it. Moses' first mistake, okay? If God ever tells you to do something, you go do what he said. You don't add to it, and you don't take away from it. And we have a real bad tendency in America of adding to and taking away from what God says because we are so proud of our little noggins. And we think we are so reasonable and so intelligent and so educated, and Moses was all of those things, that we think God said this, I'm going to say this. Anyone ever received a prophecy from someone like that? <laughs> I have. And you could tell when the spirit of the prophecy ran out and the person's spirit started taking over. And then by the time they get done, you're like, thank you, you just ruined a great word from the Lord, but I'll take what I can from that. Never add to what God says. It only messes things up, okay? Kind of like reminds me of siblings. Uh, you know, honestly, what first came to mind when I was thinking about this was Bill because of the stories his sister tell on him, especially his younger sisters. But I, if anyone's ever been a parent or, you know, had parents, most of you have had parents. Um, you know, you, the, the parent says, tell your siblings to do this. And then they go tell the siblings to do this and this, and then they add some threat of death on top of it. And you're upstairs listening going, that is not what I said. <laughs> but leave the threat of death. That's fine. It'll motivate them. That's what Moses is doing here. God tells Moses to tell the people this is what to do. And then Moses adds to it. Let's see what happens here. Go to verse 27. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Labo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where Ahaman Shishai and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them had carried it on a pole between them, along with some of the pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. And at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So they went out and explored the land, took some of the fruit, brought it back. They did what they were supposed to, did what they were told. Now go to verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. Here's Moses' second mistake. First of all, he tells them, go out and do more than God told you to do. And then when they come back, he doesn't take them aside and say, why don't you guys tell me what you got and then we'll talk to the entire nation of Israel. He says, tell everybody what you saw. So he gave the authority of the report to the people, not to God's anointed prophet. Does that make sense? Okay, that's his second mistake. Let's see what happens here. Uh, where was I? 27. No, uh, where was I? The 27? Okay, all right. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land into which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. So, number one, good, all right. Verse 28. But, don't you love that word? When someone comes up to you and, you know, you're telling them a problem, and, you know, they're saying, well, you know, I know that God loves me, and I know that he's got a great plan for my life, but there should never be a but at the end of God says. 
God says should always end with a sentence, not a but comma. Okay? Or comma, comma, but? Comma comes first? Okay. Yeah, I taught English. Can you believe it? Uh, <laughs> uh, neither did my students. They still don't believe I taught English. Okay. Uh, so, but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Now, who are the descendants of Anak? Anybody know? Yeah, the Nephilim. In fact, I think it says Nephilim in a little bit. But they're giants. Okay? That's the, uh, uh, oh, David and Goliath. That's the Goliath people that we're talking about. The big giants. That's the descendants of Anak. So we even saw the descendants of Anak there. Verse 29. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Now, what happened? Moses says, God says, explore the land. Moses says, evaluate the land, and they did just what they were told. They went out and evaluated the land according to their own perspective. And they said, the land's great, and the people are huge, and the cities are massive with giant walls. What are they implying? There ain't no way we can take this place. Okay? In fact, we go on to say, well, let's just keep reading here. We'll just read it. Verse 30, then Caleb, I love Caleb, stands up for what's right. He silences the people before Moses. He does what Moses should have done in the first place and said, uh, shut up. Stop what you're doing and just let's talk about this from God's perspective. And he said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Now, why did he say that? He saw the descendants of Anak. He saw the giants. He saw the walls of Jericho. He saw the massive armies of these peoples that populated every part of the land. He saw all of that. But he said, we can do it. Because Caleb, we'll find out later, had a different spirit. In other words, he believed God. Go to verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, I love it, they argue against him, we cannot attack these people for they are stronger than we are. What's wrong with that statement? It includes irrelevant information. Completely irrelevant information. We cannot attack the land because... That's kind of like saying, I cannot overcome sin in my body because I still have broken flesh. That is not a legitimate argument. I might as well say, I cannot get to my house because my car is broken down. Well, you don't need a car to go 10 blocks. I could walk it. My bike is still here from the way of the word. I could ride it home. You know, I got all these options. But they said, we cannot take the land because the people are too strong for us. Let's keep going here. Or stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there to the descendants of Anak. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So not only did Moses give more of a command than God had given, not only did he allow these people to speak without verifying what they had to say, not only did he not even bother to stop them when they were giving a bad report, but then he allowed them to spread this evil report among the nations. Now the context here, the idea is not that they just sat up there and said it, but once the meeting was over, they went to all the other leaders and says, don't let Moses send us into this land. We're going to die. They weren't, they weren't satisfied just saying it out loud. They made sure everyone believed them. These were evangelical, faithless people. They wanted to make sure everyone was just as faithless as they were. Now, I want you to look at that word there. The very, where is it at? 32. They spread among the Israelites a bad report. How many of you have evil? Anybody got evil in their Bibles? Evil report, a couple of you have that. That word there is a fascinating word in the Hebrew. It's deba. And deba can mean an evil report, but it also can be translated slander. Uh, it can be translated defame or defamy or infamy. In other words, this was a slanderous report. Well, who were they slandering in this report? They were slandering God. Because they were basically saying, God said, go take the land, but we can't do it. God doesn't know what he's talking about. That's what they're saying to the nation of Israel. And that's why it was an evil report. It was evil because it disagreed with what God had said. Now, how many times do we do that? 
do we disagree with what God has said? We'll get more, we'll get into that more in here in a little bit. Go to chapter 14. So we've got Moses' first mistake, Moses' second mistake, the spies' mistake, and now we've got Numbers 14, the people's mistake. Verse 1, that night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. <laughs> oh man, can you imagine? All the Israelites, well, let's stop there. I want to show you verse by verse what happens when you're faithless. What happens when you don't have faith? What happens when God says this and you believe this? Because that's what faithlessness is. It's believing contrary to what God said. Doesn't matter what God said. Okay, doesn't matter if he said something ridiculous. If he said it, not believing it is faithless. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter what you've learned. It doesn't matter what you can reason out. I love it. Some people will believe God as long as it makes sense to them. The minute it doesn't make sense to them, they stop believing God. Like somehow he's lost his throne. Somehow he's no longer omnipotent. How stupid are we to think that we know better than the God who created the brain you're using to think? But that's what they're doing. They were faithless. They believed themselves or their own reasoning against God. So what happens when you behave in a faithless manner. Well, verse 1, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. The first thing that happens is you get despair. Anytime you lose faith in God, you despair. And anytime you are in despair, you have no faith in God. You cannot have faith in God and be despairing at the same time. It is not possible. They are contradictory. Some people say, well, I believe in God. I really do. And I believe that He can do what He says, but I'm really afraid. Then you don't believe. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be harsh, but folks, that's how it is. It's kind of like saying, I'm healthy, but I've got a 106 degree temperature and every lymph node is swollen and I'm puking my guts out, but I'm healthy. No, you're not. If the symptoms point to it, that's what you got. If you have fear and despair, you don't have faith. And so the first thing that happens when you don't have faith is you get despair. Now, why is that important to note? Because despair, despair is so bad. You know, we don't think about it that way, but we've all been there. Well, we've lost hope. I love it. The, the, um, I don't remember, it was, I want to say it was Chairman Mao from China, but it was one of the communist leaders says the, the, uh, the only true hell is a lack of hope. And what he was, what he was saying was we need to take hope away from the people that have hope in God or have hope in, you know, democracy or whatever so that they'll give up and come to our side and have hope in us. But that truth goes beyond that. The only true hell is a lack of hope. Why do you think hell is going to be such a hopeless place? I remember there's a story of a guy who says he went to hell and then came back. And he says that the worst part about it is that you know you belong there. And you know there's nothing you can do about it. You can't even lie to yourself about hope. Because once you lose hope, everything collapses around you. Anybody ever been there before? Lost all hope, am I the only one? Couple of you are willing to admit it? Yeah. Things start going bad, then another thing goes bad, then another thing goes bad, and all of a sudden everything starts to fall apart, and then you go, God, where did you go? Why did you leave me? And of course, he hasn't, but that's that loss of hope, that despair, and that happens when you lose your faith. Now, it doesn't end there. Go to verse 2. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or, or in this wilderness. The second thing that happens after you get despair is you lose... Uh, let me... Let me get, what, how did I word that? You start miscalculating your circumstances. In other words, you lose sight of what's real. And you start looking at your circumstances as bigger and worse than they really are. I know I've caught myself doing that. As soon as you start getting in despair and you've lost all hope, all of a sudden every little thing that's wrong is this big giant mountain that has to be overcome. Can I get an amen on that? You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and then you get out of it and you're like, well, what's wrong with me? That was no big deal at all. But it feels like this massive deal when you don't have hope because that's what happens when you're faithless. You despair and then you start miscalculating your circumstances and thinking they're worse than they are. Now let's move on here. Verse 3. Or wait, verse 3? Yeah. Verse 3. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it have been better for us to go back to Egypt? 
You start despairing. You start miscalculating your circumstances and then you start blaming God for your circumstances. Why did you do this to me, God? Why did you let this happen? And God's in heaven going, I don't know what you're talking about. First of all, in this circumstance, it hadn't even happened yet. They were projecting failure on God that had never even occurred. And God's saying, look, just go into the land and you'll win. You're not going to lose. In fact, if you find out later, if you go down and you see them actually entering the land in the book of Joshua, they lose like six people a battle. <laughs> That's pretty good. Those are good numbers for today with body armor and tanks and stuff like that. I mean, back then, people died a lot, and yet they didn't because they had God on their side. They, didn't, they weren't believing in that. So then not only did they lose their hope and the despair, not only did they start seeing their circumstances worse than their, oh, it's better if I just die here in the wilderness, but then they start blaming God for what's wrong. It doesn't end there, though. It gets worse. Go to verse 4. And they said to each other, we should choose a leader to, and go back to Egypt. Once you've despaired... And then you start seeing your circumstances for worse than they are. Then you blame God. The next logical step is to rebel against what God's told you to do. And say, God, you told me to go into this promised land, but forget it, man. You obviously do not have my best interest in mind. I'm going to go the other direction, go back to Egypt. Not only that, but they rebelled against Moses. Okay, the, the God's chosen leader for them. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. Um, let's use marriage as an example because it's a tough thing that most of us have to go through. Uh, say that you, you feel God's picked this spouse for you, you marry the spouse, and it does not go well, and you guys are fighting, and you don't get along, and you're just at each other's throats, and then, because you don't have faith in God's promises to restore relationship, what happens? You despair. You don't have any more hope that this marriage is going to get any better. Then what do you do? Well, after you despair, you start miscalculating your circumstances. Now everything your spouse does is heretical and demonic, right? Anyone ever done that? Like, obviously you're possessed with a demon or you wouldn't behave this way around me. Okay, then you start miscalculating your circumstances. Then after that, you start blaming God. God, why did you tell me to marry this horrible Satan worshiper? And then after that, you rebel. Well, forget it. That's it. I'm getting a divorce. I don't want any more to do with you. I know God says he hates divorce, but I hate you more. I know we've got divorced people in here. Please don't take offense. I'm not judging anyone for that. We all do things that God doesn't want us to do. But think about that for just a minute. What did they do here? They said, God, you can't help us defeat these people. They're too big. You're not big enough to do it. So then we've lost hope. Now what are we going to do? So then after that, they start miscalculating their circumstances. Better if we just die right here. Then they start blaming God. Well, obviously, God, this is your fault because you led us out here. So forget you. We're going back to Egypt. Let me give you another example. Let's say you got an individual, I know several, who accept Christ as a teenager or a young person, and they're all gung-ho for Jesus for a while, but then things aren't going as well as they would like. So now they start despairing. God, I thought you said my life would be better with you. I've got an apron that says life is better with Jesus. I believe that. But it's not always better the way we think it's going to be better. So then they start despairing. You know, they, they've lost their hope. All oh, things are never going to get better. So then they start miscalculating their circumstances. Oh, my gosh, if I if I'd never believed in Jesus, my life would be better. And then they start getting angry at God. Why do you do this to me, God? And then they rebel and say, I don't want any more to do with you. What happens after you say that to God? You step out of that relationship. And we learned last week that that relationship is your ticket into heaven. That relationship is your eternal life. Scary thought, isn't it? What happened to the Israelites? They said, oh, it'd be better. Let's, let's find somebody to take us back to Egypt. Let's go to verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Nephthah, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because he will devour them. Or excuse me, we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Go to verse 10. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. 
What's the last thing? Faithlessness causes despair, causes you to miscalculate your circumstances, causes you to blame God for those circumstances, causes you to rebel against what God has told you to do. And then here comes your good Christian friend or your pastor or some teacher on the, on the, on the television or something like that and tells you that you're wrong in all these areas. What do you do? Don't you tell me where I'm right and wrong. I, I don't need you. And they reject God's spiritual authority over them. Now look, guys, I'm going to say this. I'm probably too tired to be preaching and I'm going to say things I'm going to regret later. But let me just say this to you now. I don't like being a spiritual authority, okay? I have not like I love preaching. I preach every day if, if I give the chance, but I don't like being a spiritual authority. There's a pressure there that you don't understand. There's a pressure there that I did not know until I stepped under it and went, this is really heavy. I didn't even know what it was for the first year or two I was here. I don't like being a spiritual authority because that weight sits on you. Now, God gives me strength, and I am able to do all things through him who gives me strength. So I'm not saying I'm leaving. No, I'm going to do it, but I don't like it, okay? So when I start talking about spiritual authority, don't think that I'm up here trying to toot my own horn and say, you guys need to listen to me. No, it's not like that, okay? I'm not that kind of person. But make sure that you are not that kind of person who gets upset at the spiritual authority for telling you what you're doing wrong, when you're doing it wrong, because you've lost faith. You don't have that right. Let me show you. Let's just keep going. <laughs> Let's get out of this deep water. <laughs> Protect myself from myself. All right, verse 11. I love what God says. The Lord says to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. So what does God say to these faithless people? Wipe them off the face of the earth. Completely destroy them. Moses, you're a descendant of Abraham, so I can fulfill my promise to Abraham through you. That sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? Praise God, we're under a new covenant. <laughs> but think about that for a minute. What happens when you get out of faith? You start despairing. Then you start miscalculating your circumstances. You blame those circumstances on God. After you're done doing that, you start rebelling against God and doing things he doesn't want you to do or not doing the things he wants you to do. And then you start attacking the people who God has placed over you to guide you down the right path. What is God going to say to you? Now, I don't preach hellfire and brimstone, but that does not look pleasant. God is not pleased with faithlessness. In fact, it is impossible to please God without faith. Okay? What happens? Verse 13. <laughs> this, is my favorite, this is my favorite part. I, I got so excited about this part, I texted Kara. I was like, I'm so excited! And now she's not here. So. Okay, verse 13. Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people out from among them, or up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people, uh, uh, and that you, Lord, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put all these people to death, leaving none alive, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, the Lord is not able to bring these people into the land he promised them, on oath, so he slaughtered them in the wilderness. And God said, where's Tim? I need a cricket sound. Tim does a great cricket sound. Cricket, cricket. God said nothing to that. Moses says, God, don't kill the people. It'll hurt your reputation. God was not impressed with that argument. Now, how many times, I've done this, folks. How many times have you been praying for someone who's sick? You say, God, reveal your glory so that these people might know that you are God in heaven. And God's like, I am, yay. Does God need you to defend his reputation? No, he doesn't need you to defend his reputation. He'll do it on his own. He's going to do it in a big way when the world comes to an end. So God is not impressed with Moses' argument. Poor Moses, he thought he was really being a good debater there. He said, don't do it, God. It's bad for your reputation. God doesn't say anything. So Moses tries a different tag. Look at verse 17. Uh, now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. 
The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, and of course he also talked about his word, forgive the sins of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt till now. So Moses gets up and says, God, defend your reputation. And he doesn't say anything. And then he says, God, you said, you promised, you told us this. Now fulfill it. Look at the next word here. Verse 20, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them. <laughs> God went from I'm going to wipe them all out with a plague to I have forgiven them in a couple seconds. Why the switch, God? What happened? Why did you change your mind? Because Moses said, you said. Let's keep blowing here. Verse 21. Or, I'm sorry, verse 20. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Uh, that's not a, that's not a very clear translation. It really says, I have forgiven them as, uh, according to your word. Okay, in the, in the, in the, I was gonna say Greek. In the Hebrew, the, the, uh, the word there is word. I didn't, I had it written down. I don't anymore. I must have taken it out, but it's, it's close to Dibod. It's, it's, it's kind of a reflection of that. But it's his spokenness, what he said. Okay? So let's take a look at that for a minute. The Lord goes from plaguing, I don't know, can you turn plague into a verb? Okay, all right. From destroying the nation of Israel with a plague to forgiving them, and the only thing between them was Moses saying, you said. But look at what, what did Moses say? He quoted God. And then what does God say? I have forgiven them according to your word. Moses didn't speak his word. He spoke God's word. When we talk about positive confession, don't make up your own stuff. Quote God's word. When you're fighting with a sickness in your body and you know it doesn't belong there, what do you do? You quote God's word to him. Now, does he know his own word? Yes, he's not forgetful. He's not going, oh, you're right. Sorry. That's not, that's not what he's like. Okay, he knows what he said. But notice that Moses said this stuff and then God says, according to your word, they are forgiven. Now, what's important about that? Because God's word doesn't heal. God's word doesn't deliver. God's word doesn't save. And God's word doesn't provide until they come out of your mouth. Until God's word becomes your word, it has no impact whatsoever. You don't believe me? Think about this for a minute. God knew what he had told the people. He knew that he had said, I am uh, forgiving. <laughs> I can't remember the wording there. Uh, I am slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sins and rebellion. He had already said that. He knew he said that, but he didn't forgive the people until Moses said it. Didn't God say in his word that the, the Jesus dying on the cross forgave the sins of you and the whole world? How come not everyone's going to heaven? Because until his word becomes your word, it doesn't have an impact. That's some heavy stuff, isn't it? When I got to that part, I was like, oh, that's awesome. Oh, Kara, that's awesome. And she was so upset she couldn't be here today that <laughs> she even complained this morning. I said, well, you don't have to leave, but she did anyway. <laughs> Go to verse 27. Then, Mo uh, wait, I think I skipped some stuff, didn't I? Verse 22. God finishes this statement. Well, let's do 21. Nevertheless, so God says, I will, I have forgiven them. They are forgiven. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, which means absolutely, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out towards the desert along the route to the Red Sea. Now... Okay, I'm trying to decide. I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to decide what I want to include here because it's, it's taking too long. Um, go back up to, um, uh, well, where is that? 
verse 27. Oh, okay, we haven't read it yet, that's why. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. Verse 28. So tell them, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do the very thing I have heard you say. I don't know about you guys, but I got a bad habit of speaking evil reports. Not gossiping about other people, but just saying things as they are and not as they should be. Complaining about my circumstances instead of uh, celebrating the victory I have in Jesus. You notice what God said about the Israelites? As surely as I live, I will do to them the very thing I heard them say. They said, oh, it's better that we die in the wilderness. And God said, okay, that's what you want. You can all die in the wilderness, and that's exactly what happened. What's the end of the story? Go to verse 36. We're going to skip a little bit here. Is that right? Uh, go to verse 39. Okay, verse 39. When Moses reported this to all the Israelites, they mourned bitterly. So Moses told them, you know, the, uh, the, the people that had gone, the, the spies that had gone had died of a plague, and they're not going to go into the promised land. And so the people were mourning that they disobeyed God. Verse 40, early the next morning, they set out for the highest point in the hill country, saying, now we are ready to go up to the land God had promised. Surely we have sinned. Well, what did God tell them in verse, I think it was 25, Go up to 25, it says, since the, this is God speaking. It says, since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out towards the desert along the route to the Red Sea. Then you go down to verse 39 and they go up on the hill country and say, now we're ready to go. I don't understand these people. God is with them performing miracles. They get manna every day. Then they start getting ravens. They see this pillar of fire at night. Like just that alone wouldn't scare the people out of their cities. Right? I mean, this God delivered them from Egypt. They've seen all these miraculous things. And then when God says, go into the land, they said, we can't do it, which was stupid enough. But I can kind of understand that. You face the giants like, eh, maybe, you know. Then God says, don't do it. And they say, let's go get them. How stupid are these people? Let's read here. I love it. And it wasn't just a mistake. Go to verse 41. But Moses said, we are, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies for the Amalekites and the Canaanites will face you there because you have turned away from the Lord. He will not be with you and you will fall by the sword. So Moses warns them, don't be an idiot. Don't go out and attack these people. God's no longer with you. And in verse 44... Uh, is that right? Yeah, verse 44. Nevertheless, in their presumption, they went up towards the highest point of the hill country, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord's Covenant moved from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and attacked them and beat them all the way to Hormah. Wow. Dense people. Maybe that generation really needed to be <laughs> put a little bleach in the gene pool. You know what I'm saying? Clean some things out because obviously there was a problem here. What's the conclusion of the story? Don't lose faith and always obey exactly what God tells you to do. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. And I got people, I remember I was talking to a pastor of mine uh, down in Fredonia, and he said, you know, he, he was an evangelist, really. That was his gift, was evangelism. And he was always talking to people about Jesus. And I remember one time I was kind of questioning him. I said, well, you know, what if... It's not the right time to talk to this guy about Jesus. He said, it's always the right time to talk to somebody about Jesus. Really? Anybody ever have a bad experience with that before? Where you try to talk to him about Jesus and you can tell God's not with you in it and you're like, well, I'm going to do it anyway because this is the right thing to do. There's a speaker I heard on video. He said, see a need, fill a need. Sounds good. Bad advice. Wait for God to tell you what to do and then do it and you'll always see success. If you try to do what you think you're supposed to do because it's the right thing to do, you'll end up fighting against the Canaanites, the Amalekites, and be beat all the way to Horma. And it'll happen over and over and over again. And I, I, I love my, my uh, Christian brothers and sisters in the community that say that God doesn't speak to people that way anymore, but I feel awful sorry for them because they're beating their head against a brick wall trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. And if they just listen to the Spirit of God, He'll tell them. 
And it ain't as hard as you think. I had somebody the other day say, well, I don't hear God like you do. That's, it's the same spirit lives in me that lives in you guys. How could I possibly hear any different than you? Okay? We don't understand it, but God does speak to all of us. So, lesson number one. Always do exactly what God tells you to do. Don't add to it. It'll cause problems. Don't take away from it. It'll cause problems. And then, when you're about to do it, always do it in faith. Don't be faithless. And then if you are faithless and God gives you different directions, don't go back and try to fill in the hole you left by your sin. Let Him take care of it. Let Him forgive it and move on. And always listen to the Spirit of God to guide you in your next move, whatever that's supposed to be. I had somebody ask me the other day when we're going to start another Sunday night thing. We just finished that love and respect, which was kind of specialized. So a lot of the people that used to come, you know, didn't come anymore because it wasn't, it was, it was mostly for married people. It wasn't. I mean, my Twyla was there and she got to, she's some, oh, she had to leave. Uh, she got to hear lots of good stuff while we were there, you know, and it was excellent material. But some people were like, when are we going to get back to reading the Bible? And they want to know when I'm going to start something on Sunday night. And this person who was talking to me did not like my answer. You know what I said? When God tells me to. Well, that could take a long time. Why don't we just, why don't we just do something until he says something? Because I don't do anything without God telling me what to do. That way of the warrior event was a tremendous event. Why? Because I told, I let God tell me what to do. Instead of just saying, you know what, it worked last year, let's do it again. I did rely on that a little bit, as I told you guys, and caused problems because I wasn't listening to God. Last week, I talked about your relationship with Jesus and how we need to have a strong relationship with Jesus. That needs to be the focal point of our lives, relating to Jesus and building that relationship with Jesus. You can't have a relationship with Jesus without faith. We need to overcome this obstacle in our lives where God says, go to the sick, lay hands on them. When God says, give to the poor and the needy, and it'll come back to you. When God says, give up this thing in your life that you don't want to give up. When God says, stick with that spouse that you can't stand anymore. We need to do what he says and have faith in it and not despair, not miscalculate our circumstances, not blame God, not rebel, and not attack the person who tells you. <clears throat> amen? Amen. You guys are like, I don't want to amen that last part. Not yet. I want to see what you got to do first. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word and for the examples of the Israelites. Thank you that everything that is written before is an example for us, a type and a shadow. And thank you, Father, that we can learn from their mistakes and not be faithless. Father, I pray for sensitive spirits for everyone in this congregation and everyone that's here, that, that they would know your voice, that they would hear what you have to say to them and, and to their families and to their communities, that they would speak the truth to themselves first and then allow that truth to change their life that they, in, in obedience to you. And that we can see our communities and our church and our personal lives and the whole world changed for you and your glory just by being obedient. Thank you, Lord. And I pray a blessing on each of them as they go. Help them to run into people that don't know you and to run into people that need encouragement and to have that inspiration from the Spirit that they can give to people what they need to be the hands and feet of God, to, to be the, uh, the workers sent out into the field. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.